Welcome to One Dime Radio. Today I am here with Mike Watson, a professor, writer, and a co-founder of Revil Press, a new publishing company which recently was launched, and I'll let you describe that. Mike Watson is a long-term collaborator on this channel. Some of you who are longtime One Dime Radio fans and viewers of the One Dime channel might remember him from his appearance in my video on uh, meme warfare. Uh, Mike Watson is one of the early supporters and believers in my work, which I greatly appreciate. And also, we had some great reading groups and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, this has been a collaboration that is long time coming. And I'm actually publishing a book on uh, Revo Press. But uh, today, we're going to be talking about a text that is greatly influential in the history of philosophy, and that is The Dialectic of the Enlightenment, written by Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer. This text is uh, quite crucial for understanding the Enlightenment. Now, this text is quite difficult, and it's typically popularized by the essay, The Culture Industry. That's the essay that most people read. And as a result, because of the seeming accessibility of the culture industry relative to Adorno's other work, a lot of people think they know what the dialectic of enlightenment is all about, and they either don't read the rest or they just assume they know what he's talking about. Reading this uh, text for the second time recently leading up to this podcast has made me realize how little I actually really understood it when I first read it many years ago, and I got a lot from it this time, and I'm happy to discuss it because I think this will get people thinking, get people's creative juices flowing. Before we get right into the ideas as such, Mike, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and what a Revil Press is all about and also how Adorno has influenced your work? Because after all, he appears in a lot of your books. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Great to be here. Like you say, after quite a long time. Yeah. You, you're a regular guest on the Assin Left podcast and reading groups. And the Assin Left actually will be revived soon. The YouTube channel has been kind of dormant for a couple of years now will be revived as one of the media kind of platforms for Revo Press. So Revo Press is a publisher I've set up with Dan Malo, an American lawyer yeah. and author. And it's basically a left-wing publisher looking at, at taking risks on new authors, at publishing experimental crossovers, and at, at looking at strongly Marxist reinterpretations of modernist critical theory. So, so theorists like Adorno, Marcuse, Deleuze, et cetera. And we have some great authors lined up, including yourself, obviously. And we have Derek Vaughan, who people may be familiar with. Adam Turl is well known. He actually runs a publication called uh, Locust Review and has a, a, a podcast called Locust Radio. We have myself with a book coming out. 100 Ghosts in the Machine, and we have Bram Jeevan of the podcast Strange Exiles. We have quite a good lineup, oh, a very good, amazing lineup. In the next few months, we will be releasing it. So I'm looking forward to that. And, and one of the main things is me and Dan have been with other publishers before, and we've thought a lot about the publishing industry at this kind of crucial time, actually, with AI coming in and new kind of subscription based formats coming in, like on etc and we just thought we needed a publisher that one gives time to the authors and really enters into dialogue which a lot of publishers can't do because their ads too big or just so profit oriented they don't want to spend the time and two we give very competitive royalties and we don't only give slightly higher royalties of other comparable companies we also give five percent of the profits of every other book that's published so an author will not only get their own profits, but profits of other authors' books. So it becomes a kind of collective, which is the, the kind of aim and ethos. So yeah, that's basically what Revolt Press is. And then as for Adorno, I mean, Adorno really has been my like kind of main philosopher of interest since I was studying my bachelor's degree in the late nineties, when I was studying a kind of split fine art and art theory degree. And gravity more towards the theory. I just found, you know, really hungry for more theory than we were getting on the course. Found Adorno's aesthetic theory in the library and got very into him at that point. I guess the important thing for me, having been strongly leftist, materialist leftist since my late teens, 
but being very into art was seeing somebody who looked at, you know, who was Marxist, shall we say, but also looked at, at, at aesthetics and art and, and culture. And that's Adorno's main thing, Adorno and, and his fellow Frankfurt School thinkers, is that they kind of took Marxism and appended a study of aesthetics to that. So that's my main, yeah, that's why I got into Adorno. And I've just remained Adornian since then. Although it's like one of those things of having to kill your philosophical father, which is not overdue. I need to somehow, I need to somehow do a number on Adorno, but I, I'm, I'm still finding it very useful. I just think somehow we all need to get beyond our heroes, partly because they tend to be fairly antiquated. And we'll talk about that as we go through, I guess, that, that Adorno is not entirely applicable to, to now. Right. And all of us here are against book worship and as Adorno himself would be. But I think to truly appreciate the gravitas of dialectics of the Enlightenment, one has to probably first really elucidate the historical context in which this is being writing in, written in. Because they're writing, of course, in right after World War II, right? Well, right after the Holocaust. And they see fascism takes shape, takes power. Would you like to discuss the historical context that birthed the dialectic of the Enlightenment? Because it's very inseparable from the thought itself. I think the most important thing to understand is the fact that Adorno and Horkheimer are both being in exile. They were both scholars of an existing institute, the Institute for Social Research, which is based in Frankfurt. It's known as the Frankfurt School, yeah. Although you won't ever find the Frankfurt School. And that's, I know, there's kind of jokes of American tourists going to Frankfurt and saying, hey, where's the Frankfurt School? We want to get a photo outside it. And there's no actual Frankfurt School. It is a Frankfurt School of Finance now. So if you Google the Frankfurt School, you end up with that, which is a kind of the old chestnut of co-optation, basically. But Adorno and Wilkheimer, as these left-wing theorists, Marxists looking at, at culture, were a threat to the Nazi system, or and they were Jewish, so they were basically they were not, you know, they, they were not favoured in Nazi Germany and fled to the US. And they were fortunate because, of course, Benjamin, who was mostly affiliated with the Institute, Walter Benjamin, did manage to flee. He actually got caught up in in Spain and, and committed suicide. He was a good friend of Heimer, and they, well, I say a good friend, they they, they funded him, and, and he he had links to the Institute as a scholar. And so Adorno and Volkheimer were exiles during World War II and found themselves in America and really were looking at the differences between fascism in Europe and the system in the US and found that there actually were a number of similarities between fascism as they perceived it, Soviet communism as they perceived it, and then they wouldn't be able to fully perceive what was happening in Soviet Russia at that point. The US democratic capitalism, as it were. And basically they found there was a similar tendency towards control of the population through, through propaganda, through stories and a kind of pervasive, almost kind of what people, what you might call acceleration now, but a, a tendency to subjugate people in the name of technological advance, in the name of, in the name of enlightenment, effectively. So you would have a situation where the kind of the, the, the zenith of, of industrial political advance almost justified controlling people. And this happening in fascism in a totalitarian way, but it's happening in the US in a way that was democratic in that you had a certain amount of choice, but the choice always being between samey capitalist products, whether they'd be media products or whether they'd be consumerist products. And that kind of fits very much within the logic of you know, a, a capitalist symbolic system that was supposed to replace in the Enlightenment period a religious and, and, and mythic system of, of, of symbols. So basically what Dawn and Hawkeye must say is that the major threat to humanity has always been nature. So there's always been an attempt to overcome nature by putting in the intermediary symbols between um, humanity and, and nature in the intermediary ciphers which started off as kind of magic and religious icons and mythic stories and ended up being instead the, new, the, the numerical count or the scientific measure, which was kind of ostensibly, you know, produced or I would say conceived to do away with, you know, kind of arbitrary power systems associated with, with religion and, 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 and myths and magic. 
that actually ended up basically repeating the same problem. So there's a whole, the whole part at the beginning of the dynamic, dynamic of enlightenment, which explains this by looking at lights of scholar, Bacon, and you know, it always makes me think of the painter, but the same name as the painter, Francis Bacon, but the philosopher, and basically kind of lays out this, the, 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 their thought system and the idea that enlightenment is a, is a kind of regression into mythic thinking where it was supposed to be a kind of now dialectic is that the, the enlightenment contains myth and, and myth already contained enlightenment because it already had this kind of process of, you know, putting intermediary narratives or figures between man and nature. So it was already kind of doing what science ended up doing with a numerical count. And then under capitalism, you end up with a situation where everything is the numerical count. So you have this system in America, you have like, okay, well, you have freedom to have your own job or career. Ostensibly. You can vote for anyone. You can buy X many products. And you have a system in, in uh, Nazi Germany where there's kind of a literal numbering of people in the extreme cases. If you think about the concentration camps, uh, a literal treating of people, tre treatment of people as, as uh, financial ends in a sense, or as, as an, end, an end to power. But actually, you know, you end up with much the same thing because if you kind of, if you look at what it means to place people under a kind of number system, you have a situation where, you know, and can you say, well, what's probably the best technology to use? Like an iPhone is worth X thousand euros. And then the person is worth X thousand euros in a year in terms of the profitability. So people are reducing all to iPhones, for example. So far from elevating people out of, you know, control, uh, you end up with them being even more controlled by the system that they set up to create. Right. So this is where we've already got some heads exploding already, uh, just hearing that. And uh, when untangling difficult texts, the, the approach I typically like to take is a sort of Hegelian dialectic approach where we first start with the universal, the totality, the broader uh, contradictory totality, then move closer to the particulars within it and then go back again to the totality, which so that then it retroactively makes sense. It's almost like we start at the end, then go backwards, then go back again, you know? It's sort of that approach uh, I find uh, can help because r right there, I find it very difficult to explain. I was going to ask you what the dialectic of the Enlightenment actually was because that's, you know, the, the title of the book and what is this dialectic of the Enlightenment? And you sort of are, already answered that, but I think to understand that, maybe we have to understand well, the, what is the Enlightenment. And of course, he, he talks a lot about Francis Bacon being a sort of a perfect exemplar of what the Enlightenment project was. Uh, but of course, there's also a Kant, what is Enlightenment, very famous, and he, sits, uh, he cites that, I believe. And Kant, ba basically, the Enlightenment is an attempt to have master, human mastery over themselves, like to kind of to be free from mythical, well, <laughs> that's the paradox, the mythical, spiritual, religious forces that do thinking for us, that kind of, in which we're not really free, in which we're, uh, the world is explained by these religious forces, but we instead try to understand the world scientifically and try to be, become free thinkers, et cetera. It's a lot of ways one could explain the alignment. A lot of us have a general idea, but the dialectic, as you pointed out with the quote, the famous quote he says, and I think this is worth untangling on its own, is he says, myth is already enlightenment and enlightenment reverts to mythology. Now, this has been a theme I'm very interested in in the past year. I'm curious how you would explain this paradoxical quote, uh, because in many ways it contains the really essence of his thesis. Well, I mean, there, there is, as I said, but I can unpack it a bit more that the fact of myth having a kind of logic embedded in it. So it was when you get to now and you, you look at the way we try and free ourselves through numerical count, then you think about the whole kind of cliche of you're waiting in line at the bank or the doctors and they call out your number and you're like, okay, I'm just a number. And, and then, and, and how disempowering that is, you know, so, so you get a situation where, okay, in mystic thinking, you have a number of gods, which stand for, you know, and you have a number of gods which kind of stand as intermediaries between humanity and nature. So you want some story to explain 
how an earthquake happened, that, you know, you have a, a mythic story relating to gods fighting or some such thing. So you can say, well, in a way, you know, you turn nature into a, not a miracle system, but a narrative system, but also given that humans became dependent on myth, there was a whole religious system around it. You kind of tie humans into that same narrative system as well. So you've not only controlled nature, but you controlled people by being dependent on the myth, which for us, it may be even easier to see in terms of religion. So in religion, you have the God, you have God, you have, depending on different religions, but you have, you have a number of intermediaries normally between the lay people follow the religion and God. So you're like, well, okay, well, God's pretty much taking care of all of the unexplained. And, and, and then, you know, you also have some kind of way of, of understanding what happens after you die. So that should free us, but actually it doesn't free you because you have followed that religion to make sure that you fall on the right side of God or that you gain God's favor. So, you know, you can see two kind of parallel systems. So the dialectic is where myth already has a system not that different from capitalism. There's a narrative that is supposed to free people, but actually ends up controlling people. And then when you get to the item that's supposed to escape myths, you see, well, actually, you know, where you've got your apparently advanced miracle mm -hmm. system, it, it only really does what mythic religion does, arguably in a more crude way. And then if you get to Ken, if that was easy enough to follow, it gets a bit more complicated here, but I think Ken's important. And it's not really said in the night, but it's something that came up with it came up recently, this period around, or I'm mentioning it was around 2010, when the speculative realists became the big thing in philosophy. And speculative realists are, I mean, it's a loose grouping that people disagree on. Oh, no. Is. But you have Graham Harmon, Quentin Meyer, Sue, I, I forget, it was, they're normally there were to, 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 to four of them. Ray Brassier was one of them. And then actually Ray Brassett didn't like the term splitting realism himself. In any case, they were a group of philosophers that believed we had to get beyond the subjective nature of philosophy. So philosophy is highly subjective. It's about people thinking about existence. So it can't not be subjective, but each of them in their own way, basically said, well, we need to consider the object, but not only consider the object, which is impossible perspective, apparently we have this blockage in, you know, well, we can't really know what objects are. You know, what we think about objects, you have that issue, but you have to deal with that issue. And, you know, maybe we can really think of objects through science to help us do that. But the other thing is that uh, we have to consider that we have to, we have to admit, we have to freely deal with and accept the fact that surely we are objects. Okay. So it was basically an anti-Kantian look because what Kant had done in his effectively Kantian term, but it's often called the Copernican term. What Kant did is he basically said, look, we have to consider the limits of human thought to literally be the limits of what can be thought. So we can no longer be thinking about what is the nature of God? You know, what is, what's the nature of being, what's, what's the nature of things outside the human mind? And the, the reason he does that is it's an anti, well, it's an, it's an enlightenment move. It's an early enlightenment maneuver. It's an anti kind of mythic religious thinking because you know the problem with mythic religious thinking is you get into you know when hey i've decided that there, you know there's a god and he has a son that affects many saints archangels etc and you need to worship them in this in this way it basically eliminates somebody who is good with words and good with narratives abusing those words and narratives for the sake of, the, of their own gain so Kant says no to avoid all that let's just to thought, which is to basically reflecting on itself. And the problem there is that the kind of, the dialectic comes in where is if, where if you restrict human philosophy or strict philosophy to the bounds of human thought, you restrict the entire existence to the bounds of human thought, because that's all there is. You see what I mean? I think, so, I think one way one can contextualize it is, well, myth is typically viewed as the antithesis of reason, and reason is really trying to overcome myth. It's trying to think things logically, but the enlightenment is already, myth and myth is already enlightenment. The way I sort of understand that is because both involve 
that actual project, which the Enlightenment was supposed to be, which is this dominance over nature and a sort of empowerment of humanity. And this is something I thought about a lot because I've been learning a lot about the history of myth and in this inescapable theme of human history. And Adorno acknowledges this because when I first read this, I didn't. I, I read it almost like a normative statement he was saying about men dominating nature. And I thought that this was a kind of anti-modernist sort of claim, but it's not, Adorno isn't critiquing the Enlightenment as from the standpoint of someone who is a, a romanticist or a someone who rejects the Enlightenment, but someone who believes it should be self-critical and self-aware because the myth already all does this project, right? Of getting humans to effectively feel that they have control over, the, over nature. And as a result, have exerted a certain degree of control. I mean, the earliest expression of this is actually a rain dances. Someone, Claude Levi Strauss, writes a lot about this. Is rain dances in which human, in which primitive societies would dance, and they would around the time in which there would be rain, and they would feel as if they had control over nature by doing that, even though they would do it. So there was a subconscious element to which they believed it, but not, but they acted as if they believed it, which is important, the important part. And by doing so, you feel a certain collective empowerment that, okay, I'm not just alienated completely from nature and I might have an effect on it. And this, of course, takes advances through organized religion and all these other ways. And enlightenment tries to overcome myth through reason, but it also involves that project of controlling. So I see his critique is that as enlightenment um, evolves with science and there's these scientific methods of calculation, he he talks a lot about mathematics and quantifying and these processes. Of course, he's very similar from to Max Weber and this whole critique of rationalization and the disenchantment that comes with a world in which things are no longer explained by mythical forces, but by quantification and objective facts. But it becomes myth because it, while the Enlightenment was supposed to be about all humans as sort of liberating themselves and reason, it, the Enlightenment ends up reverting to myth in, insofar as we subordinate e- each other hierarchically and humans effectively create structures and mastery in which they can't es- themselves escape. That's the way I sort of read it. And Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's exactly, yeah. I, I think we've we said that in different ways. But I, I think the weather example, rain dance, is really an interesting example. You look at how weather forecasts proceeded over time, they've become so accurate, they change every few minutes, you know, because the weather is so complex that the weather forecast, you know, is often basically telling you what's happening now because, it, you know, it, because it's modified so much. So it, it, is, it becomes you know, akin to looking out the window and saying, now it's doing this. This is what I mean. It's no longer a forecast anymore. It it, is a literal real-time update of of, of the latest changes and how they affect it, how they affect every single area. So you go from a rain dance where you basically almost go, it's raining, let's do a dance. And then you go, yeah, we made it rain to a situation where you've got a branch weather system or something that literally look at the weather and go, it's raining. Therefore, the forecast is raining. So we've come kind of full circle. This, why I thought a lot about this is because I originally went from a sort of critique of actually existing socialism and Marxism, which saw it as a religion, and my critique was that it became a religion, to sort of adopting an increasingly more cynical, I guess you could call, view that all politics actually must involve religion because religion, and what I mean by religion is really a system of collective myths, which, and collective myths and collective rituals. And this is sort of unavoidable due to the fact that politics is an intervention into history. By its nature, politics is a imp- almost making the possible. I, I distinguish politics from administration, policy making, or who is going to govern the existing system. Politics is a contestation of changing reality, of changing power relations. And that, how do you get people to do that? How do people, myth, and you see all great political transformations throughout history. 
involves degrees of myth. I mean, the biggest ones, they all involve some sort of self-sacrifice. And how do you people, how do you get people to do things that are individually irrational, but maybe collectively long-term rational? Myth. Yeah, that, that's very right true. Hand. Yeah, that's very true of Marxism and, and, and its strong kind of links to to Judeo Christianity, to to the Zionism. Uh, you know, really, and really, I think in this almost Zionism, prohibition. Of, sorry, sorry. Did you say Zionism? Uh, I said Judeo Christianity, uh, basically. Oh. Yeah, I was Jude, well, the Zionism. Oh no, I said the Zionism. Sorry, then I said the Zionism. That's why I said okay, Zionism. not Zionism. I, mean, <laughs> I Zionism. I, I won't get into Zionism. Today, I mean, all, almost touching on that, but the messianism. I mean, basically, yeah, the notion that there's a utopia coming you know, at some future point, and that one must ask, one mustn't ask that the date of the future. And of course, in, you know, in the Bible, it literally says one shouldn't ask when it's coming, but will be coming, or, or the end times will be coming, and later on, you may get to heaven. I mean, and we in see Marxism, that with Marxism. Marxism, yeah. it's a bit, yeah, it's like. You know, it's not a point to ask when. We don't know when. It's, and it's going to be a perpetual revolution anyway. You know, we don't know quite how it's going to work out. At the end, you're going to end up in a situation where, you know, you could make your art and, you know, grow your gardens and it's, you know, we live in bliss. But, you know, it might not happen. It might not well, happen. Well, yeah, I mean, like, to be fair, the Marxists, they're, they are, they distinguish them as, themselves as scientific as opposed to utopian. And they say Marxism is not about a utopia, but, there's all of these quasi-religious aspects That's in Marxism, true, I mean, but, like I mean, the idea Mar that the state will wither away, or the idea that his history is sort of like an inevitable process. You see it more yeah. with Engels because Marx, there is like a sharp difference between his polemics uh, in like the Communist Manifesto and the likes of Capital, which is much more scientific and more impersonal. But you really see it in uh, more bleed together in Engels, I think, because if anyone's read Dialectics of Nature. It almost reads like I'm reading like Carl Jung, like a spiritualist. I, I'm not. I'm serious. Like, I it, have to read it. Yeah, it is quite insane to the degree of which it talks about the process of history. Okay. It's like a theological you, you, text. Yeah, you did get that with Marx a little bit in, in Capital One. Obviously, there's the famous dancing table, and that's often interpreted. You, you know, that, you know that part of Capital One where he talks about. Actually, I have to recall that we have what happens. He talks about a table. I think it's really making the point, yeah, the, the table. That's the commodity the fetishism part? Yeah, he's talking about commodity fetishism. So he, he says basically that a commodity, it, it kind of controls the human, it's his whole point. But he ends up talking about a, a dancing table. And you think, well, how did that come about? You know, it's, it's a weird image, a dancing table. Mm. Right? And there's, there's a thought that maybe this comes from Ouija. Ouija boards that were very popular at the time that he was writing. But he, he in any case, means you know, inanimate objects have the capacity to control people and make people do certain things or behave in certain ways. I guess, you know, the way we gather around the table, it's like the table is part of the, the dialogue. It, it brings people to it. So I guess this is part of what he was saying as well. But other than that, you I know, saw like, that is like a scientific analysis of mythical elements, yeah, right? I think analysis, but, it, but then it doesn't change the fact that we, we definitely are controlled by objects that we produce to control us. I'm sorry, no, we produce to control. So we produce them so that we, so that we can control them, but they end up controlling us. And we right. pursue them so that we can control them. You can own them, but they can be tools for us. But in pursuing them, they're, they're already dominating us. I uh, have a sort of way uh, analogy that I think I explained it to my friend the other day, and he was like, Oh, I get it now. I don't know, this could miss the mark. But the way I see modernity and the Enlightenment. Partially due to this is due to urbanization, the fact that more people live in cities and you have a concentration of populations and you have mass communications that allow people to be more in, interconnected, a sort of globalization that is unprecedented and uh, you have less localized uh, living. Of course, tons of people have written about this, like Weber, uh, Durkheim, it's a very big sociological theme. It's actually what birthed sociology as such. Uh, but the way I think of it is modernity is the first time you start getting matrices in the sense of matrices are these structures that we create, systems of codes. And, and I mean, it's, it might sound like a little wacky because of the matrix, but I mean, this is an act systems theory with like uh, Nikas Luhmann and thinkers like that. Uh, but basically, I like the word matrix just because it sounds cooler. But the idea is 
we have stru- we build structures as humans in which we want to create stable orders to master what is a really chaotic mode of production capitalism it is you know mark it's called the anarchy of the market for a reason it's while it's very progressive in many ways and very evolutionary it is extremely chaotic more than any other system ever so you need a more bureaucratic state to control it you need a more bureaucratic organized education system to produce workers and managers to organize this and to evolve it. And you create like, and this is also reinforced by enlightenment ideology in which we have better science that we can control forces more, but we create matrices to, to control uh, our societies better and stabilize order. But as a result of when we create those systems, matrices, whatever we want to call them, that are so tightly encoded, the code ends up actually subordinating us and becomes more irreversible and difficult to actually change. And we become one-dimensional. And this is the sort of shared theme you see in Marcuse's One Dimensional Man Mm -hmm. and Adorno's uh, Dialectic dialectic of the Enlightenment, as well as Baudrillard, with uh, Jean Baudrillard's Genealogy of the Simulacrum. And you can see it really in Simulations, the essay, I think, explains it better than Simulacrum Simulation or The Perfect Crime is another good one. He's dealing with that at the level of the image. But that's sort of the way I like to understand this because one can't simply... What, what I like is Adorno, he's looking at this dialectically, meaning he's seeing the contradictions. He's not trying to look for a return to tradition type of narrative, which is the way the conservative position one can react to this or one can react to this in a blindly progressive left disposition, which will be an enlightenment that is unaware of itself and perpetuates this exact problem that he's describing. I don't know how you think if that's a decent way of conceptualizing that or not. I, I think it works. Yeah, I think we're saying a similar thing. I, I suppose the issue is, I work no two things, is that are we bringing the audience with us? Because it's quite complex. And then how do we apply this to now? But I think we need to maybe go a bit more into a bit more in that was hard because I'm not sure how much of this is actually aged well. That's another story. We'll, we'll yeah, get to, I, I wanted to get to that towards the end. Yeah, I think maybe we need to get a bit more beneath the surface of, of, of what Adorno is specifically yes. doing. Yes, we, we should always say Adorno and Horkheimer. Yes, we tend yeah. to say Adorno, but yeah, Adorno and Horkheimer. Do you have any other follow-up questions or points about the the text? Sure. Yeah. So. Really, the first two chapters, one is about really centers around man's domination of nature, which we've already kind of discussed. And I think this point is the one I don't like to focus on too much because it's the one that all the explanations already cover. And it's also, I think, quite familiar and intuitive. A lot of people get this sense that there is this control over nature that it subordinates us. Like you have this critique in more intelligent ways and less intelligent ways, I think, in the more Less intelligent way would be like Ted Kaczynski. You know, if you take an extremely anti-modernist position, one can you know result in that. But there is an intuitive kernel of truth in that sort of critique. And you mm-hmm. see it in more intelligent ways with Heidegger, of course. You know, his critique of enlightenment and reason, but that's more complicated. The second chapter that it deals with myth, and that's I think. What I like to focus on, he brings up, you know, he like he talks about the Odyssey by Homer and uh, Odysseus, the character, and I didn't actually read the Odyssey in uh, high school. I was exposed to a lot of literature, and I never read the Odyssey after. I still haven't read the Odyssey. I've only I'm going off of what Adorno says about it, so I think I'd appreciate it probably more if I did read the Odyssey. I'm curious, assuming you have, what Adorno is going on about the Odyssey and what his point is with regard to myth and the Enlightenment and why he chooses this text to explain his point. Yeah, and the Odyssey, I did read, I was writing my PhD and and I wrote a lot on the Dalek of Enlightenment at that point. We're going back, well, not that long ago, 2012, I finished that like that. I mean, I guess the point is that Odysseus 
goes on his journey in the Odyssey and he basically finds himself coming up against fearful monsters and other you know, challenges. And he always has some kind of way out. So he's famous for his cunning. Uh, the, the famous example that Dorno uses to kind of, to point out the similarity between, again, between me and Lightman is the parable of the oarsman. Okay. So basically, if Vitius is on this ship, he's kind of directing his men and they need to get somewhere and they need to go past these sirens, which are kind of female temper that are on a, a kind of a rock going past, if I recall properly. And then they, they, they sing and their, their song is what would entice the men away from the mission and then towards these temptress women. And, uh, I mean, it's not going to go well. They end up with women. It's not good. The intent is not good of the women. I mean, this is all obviously into how this sounds now <laughs> in terms of relations between men and women. But he, let's just say that they, they want to avoid at all costs the sirens. Yet they, you know, the song is very enticing. Okay. So it's like the sirens are a fearful nature, you know, which is somehow uh, unavoidable. Okay. So nature, which, you know, which will, you know, have, have its way with you, um, which you are linked with, which are, you know, somehow you want to avoid it. You want to avoid it because you want to avoid the threat of nature. That's sanity, basically. So, and the temptation of irrationality, you know, the seduction of these. Yeah. The, rational the, the, type of forces in which. Um, yeah. It will take them off their path. So they, they have a, an aim which is very masculine and involves going in a certain direction. There's these women that will, that will take them off path. And, you know, for reasons that are romantic, sexual, or, or, or just you know, pure rationality or raw nature. And so there's many metaphors. But the method this is uses, he has his men plug their ears. And so their ears are plugged. They can't hear the song of the sirens. And they row onwards, but this year's need to be able to direct the men away from the sirens. He instead has himself bound to the mast of the ship and is listening to the song, but you know, in this kind of point of, it's of torture of both listening to it and being deeply enticed, but not being able to go to the sirens and at the same time having to push his men onwards. And the point that Adorno makes is that it's like, you know, the, it's like society today where you have um, scientific and capitalist forces. And then, the, you know, he talks about science in, in, in a derogatory way often. He does make the point right from the beginning that he's not anti-science, but it's more the way science that they're way off in terms of rationality. You have these forces of capitalism and rationality. Capitalism being a kind of rationality got awry. And then they are trying to keep nature at bay, temptation at bay, but... I mean, na nature's kind of mix of up to temptation and, and, and penalty. But at the same time, those people that are directing us, trying to keep us at bay, are equally impeded because, of course, the distance is not free at the point of these, these tied to the mask. So there's a system which it basically, you know, the system, let's just, we could say that the, the plugging of the ears and, and, and the time himself, the distance to the mask, that is a kind of rationality. But that very system that you use to, to, to surpass nature, literally to go past the, the, the dangers of, of the sirens, it's also a trap. So you haven't actually escaped nature at all. So that's mm -hmm. what I was talking about. Because throughout you know, the Odyssey, that's the kind of situation that Odysseus is actually finding himself in. So he has always this cunning. He, he's like, he's often said that he's the first novel and he's like the first modern man. Because there's always this kind of cunning and this evasion you know, that results in a failure and they're kind of double buying your know, bound by nature, bound by your own, you know, your own restrictions to to avoid nature. And, and I, this isn't at all in the, the dialectic, but I guess that you get the same problem with Christianity, Christianity as well. Then you get this kind of man, God, Jesus, who is supposed to free us, but then he himself has to end up, has to undergo crucifixion. So it's pretty pervasive, I think. Right. Well, I can 
kind of see that's also what I got from his reading of the Odyssey. I haven't read it. I'd love to now. But what I got from it was that we want to avoid the temptation of these chaotic structures, which we want to prevent ourselves from falling into. And these aspects of what well, you could, could read it as nature being us, our fate being determined by nature and being seduced by these forces of nature that could le- take away our agency. And there's a sort of stoic component to trying to abstain and trying to from these temptations and also to control these forces and decide one's fate. But as a result, by tying, being tied and by having a mask or in, you know, shutting one's ears, the paradox of that is we end up creating new structures of enslavement to avoid that enslavement to nature. Right. Mm-hmm. That's sort yeah, of, yeah. we're kind of, you just see there's like two ways of explaining the same thing, pretty much exactly what you just said. Uh, but it is a difficult point to wrap one's head around. And the interesting thing uh, with regard to this, I think, is that he, Adorno kind of uses this logic to then say the Enlightenment is totalitarian. Now, he says this as someone who is not a postmodern anti-enlightenment thinker who believes in only perspectivism. There's only different perspectives. There isn't truth. He's not a pseudo-Nietzschean. He is not a conservative who has a romantic idea of pre-modern life, but is a critical Hegelian because he's a dialectician but has his own critiques of Hegel. One can debate to whether those critiques are legitimate. I have a feeling Zizekians would object to some of those criticisms. But he is, he says enlightenment is totalitarian is one of the most cra- crazy sounding arguments. What is he getting on about that? And how is he using the word totalitarian? Because some people have an aversion to this term due to its Cold War usage politically, because people think specifically about regimes. But he is talking about totalitarianism almost like an ontological category. Is he not like an, at the level of totality, at the level of obscure, obfuscating, and traversing contradiction? Yeah. Well, there's this kind of relativism where, where capitalism offers kind of choice, or that that's the ostensible, ostensible offering is that, you know, you can choose between this and this and this Hollywood film, but you're effectively getting much the same thing. But the, the belief in the choice, the belief in that capitalism is freedom is a kind of totalitarianism. And to question that is a kind of heresy. So I think he's talked about this and this becomes clearer in the final essay of the book on the culture industry, but you don't want to get too much into that, partly because it's what people always talk about when they talk about this book. And there's really a lot more happening than that. But, you know, I think in any case, if you think about freedom as being the freedom to, to work for a wage, okay, so you're free, you could work for a wage, then you have a number attached to you. So, so there's that element as well. It's the, the belief that, you know, absolute freedom means a situation in which you can measure anything. You can quantify anything because the quantification is the disenchantment of that thing. The disenchantment mm-hmm. is the putting that thing away from the religious sphere where power can be abused because false kind of realities can be evoked um, by, by people who, who apparently are more knowledgeable than you are. So, you know, to get rid of that thing, we get to a thing where we have a situation where, well, you know, no longer is, no longer are things only able to be only narrativized by an elite kind of priesthood scholar class, you know, you now have a situation in which everyone is in a sense in on the measure, even though there are elite scientists, you know, measuring is something we can in a sense do. Mathematics is something we all learn. But at the same time, you know, we therefore all enter into the measure. We all become part of a number system. So I think that that's how I would see it. That's how I'd come to see it. Read with Become NPCs, as the kids today would call it. How'd you say that again? NPCs. 
Oh, NPCs, yeah. Uh, is it non-player character? Yeah. Yeah, they're playing with the, the kind of Wojak, isn't there? It basically, it's like a, the, the uh, character in the computer game that isn't actually playing. Yeah, that they just kind of have a script and that they have like the same sort of... And that actually, the, the NPC is a popular thing, as you know, in the, the all white mm -hmm. circle. People all right anymore, but you know, they, they, they're the far right online. But you know, they, they would say it for similar reasons to what we're saying, or their interpretation of Adorno is far off the mark. We're just, let's not even get into that. But they're effective, they're touching upon a similar thing of mm -hmm. we are effectively controlled by, by capitalism. Yeah, they just have yeah. a very different idea as to what that's the paradox is everyone that's why it's kind of a, a an ironic thing because everyone thinks they're not an NPC who uses the term, right? That's true, but yeah. Part, what, what I think they're all getting at is a sense of homogeneity. Well, they're touching upon problems with capitalism, but always, always for the wrong reason. So, you know, this Trump will set us free for an economic yet inequality, or although Trump is so blatantly, you know, of, of the capitalist class, which is responsible for these problems. Of course, so is Biden, so we get into a problem. But Trump, Trump appears different, unlike the typical politicians. So. He well, seems like a break from the NPCs. That is how Hitler appeared. And I'm sure that yeah. now goes into that. Because mm -hmm. um, Hitler had this kind of uh, rough vernacular. He was very kind of crude in his speech. He used to get very angry. And I'm sure he was mostly here with footage of Hitler. Mm -hmm. But screaming uh, in his speeches, clearly on the uh, pets of beans. <laughs> and and but, but very different, very refreshing. An elite political class in Germany that's like quite one Germany prior to that. So it's a definitely a comparable situation. And then this is like there's a threat throughout the book. So there's a whole thing about screaming in the, in the face of nature. The screaming of the the in the Odyssey, right? Yeah, that you're referring to the, chat the sirens. The sirens. Oh, oh, there is. He does talk about the sirens, but he's also another part where he talks about. The primordial scream of early man, face of nature. Oh, so okay. It's, and it's something that almost it seems not really relevant. But then, if you go through his works, you keep seeing the same scream and the shrekum or the shriek, and then the subsequent shudder. It's you like I, I think of it like the the real. That's how I think of it. Like the sh what he calls the shudder. Yeah, it's like it, it's like a temporary exposure to the Lacanian real, real, in which you're like. Established reality is shattered, is like shattered. I'm going to think, but what I don't know is what you say, Dalek, you've been right about is that early man had a, well, there's two things happening. There's a hardening, there's a closing of oneself off in the face of nature. Uh, it's a kind of mimesis, he says. The or, mimesis. Or, yeah, I was going to ask you what he meant by mimesis, because uh, I, I wonder if it influenced your, uh, influ your interest in memes, because I don't think. He has really anything to do with memes. Uh, no, no, know. it's, it's the me, M I M, M I M E. They come from from my, yeah, M I M I. Or mimicry. There's a couple of different things happening. Yeah, what does he mean by mimesis? He, he basically means in mimesis, he means a feigning of nature to try and ward off nature. So he talks about different types of this kind of copying nature to try and escape nature. So you might have like, the magic charm, uh, you know, you're supposed to ward off evil and maybe you make, you, so you make the magic charm look kind of scary, a bit like a Halloween pumpkin or something. And Adorno would say, well, if that's a thing that's happened, think about magic ritual, when you think about myths, if you think about religion, you have these things which are kind of understanding that you worship uh, and they, they, they take away the threat of nature somehow, okay, so they're an intermediary. And then Adorno says, you you actually have human behaviors which act like learning and mimesis as well. So he says that one thing that happens is that in trying to kind of ward off the fear of nature, we kind of, we get this tense jawed grimace. He talks about the grimace in the book a couple of times. That you can imagine the fear of nature, which hardened into a grimace, the grimace being like a teeth tensed expression. The grimace being a kind of like, refusal to submit to nature. You can imagine if you were in a fight that you'd like tense your teeth, you know, tense your face. And that being a moment of, of rigidity or rejection of nature. But he says in the grimace, in the moment mm -hmm. of the grimace, 
you are almost in a rigor mortis that you, you're in that locked jaw position. You may as well be there. What's the rigor mortis mean is. for the audience? Uh, rigor mortis. Other than the is, song by Kendrick Lamar. It's, uh, it's, it's a medical term or a scientific term for when the uh, body stiffens when you die. Okay. So if you think about a moment of tension when you face a physical threat, then you, you tense up in a similar way to, to when you die. So I don't want to say that in a way it's a kind of plague dead, um, in which you may as well actually be dead. But he says that that's something that happens, but which gives way to a scream. And it's the scream is a moment of release. And the scream is a moment in which you realize your difference from nature. Okay. So there's, there's some kind of, what he said is you go through the grimace and then there's a kind of shudder and a shudder giving way to the scream. And this shudder and sweep at the moment of realizing that, that mankind is different from nature and that being in a way the horror, the horror is our difference from nature because, you know, if you're different from nature, then you're to be subject to the threat of nature. And he talks about this and then he gets on in the end of the book to Hitler and then Hitler's grimace. Because you think about the way Hitler was kind of locked jawed, very tense, partly because of the of but that's, that's relevant to, to Adorno's argument what we're saying here, but if you think about that, and if you think about that Shemakismo stance of Trump and the Machismo stance of Putin, you, know, you, you have this, the people, who, these two people who are very clearly insecure and that, that you know, that big why hmm. they're in politics. Interesting and in examples. Uh, and, and then having this fear of nature and then rigidifying into this grimace as well. And this grimace giving way to a kind of scream at times when you think about how Trump shouts. So then, then being like, then, not only them being power in the bottom period, them being like prehistoric man, they're not being any different. They're, they're going through the same motions of this grimace and this scream. And then that going back to Odysseus, um, him on the, the hull of the ship going past the sirens, of him being bowed, of him being in power, but of him being restricted. So, you know, you look at Biden, obviously part of this is his age. When he doesn't look at all comfortable, he's completely rigid. And he, he certainly was when he was young with a lot of footage. But you often see this with politicians. When they, when they all line up at a G8, a G8 summit, they look like lines of like, dead bodies. You know, when you see the coffin sometimes, footage of like, I said this in one of my books, you probably remember, to end towards the conceptual militancy. But often they, they're kind of like very stiff posture. In G8, G8 photos, they look like a line of like, say, a eight coffins of this being a kind of like, you know, this is how many people, this is an example of uh, mass killings of villagers. The ex Yugoslavia before, but now say Ukraine or something. Uh, and somehow they, they're in a similar position, of course, I don't want to compare particular, particular world leaders with dead um, civilians, but they're not free, certainly. They don't they ever look um, in a position of freedom. I, th I just thought of an example that I think is very contemporary because you're thinking about how can we relate this to the present. I think there's ways in which it's relevant and not relevant to the present, but one of the relevant ways is the pandemic. And I remember when I first read this book, which was actually, I think, in the pan during the pandemic at the start. And one of my reactions was, Okay, Adorno, why are you so annoyed with the Enlightenment? It seems like the problem is that there's not enough Enlightenment. People don't believe in science. That's what I originally thought. But actually, I think Adorno is relevant here because his thing is not anti-Enlightenment, but that Enlightenment's failure enables the rise of the likes of fascism. And it, it makes the, the failure of the Enlightenment, this, its failure to be aware of itself, to undermine itself, leads to stuff like fascism. And I, th I think a good example of this is how you have these far-right reactions to vaccines. And let's be honest, the, the way in which the pandemic was handled and administered was in this extremely bureaucratic, statist way, which involved locking people down. It involved even the way it was covered in the media. People it just covered the pandemic at the level of death counts. You know, the it was people were nothing but dead bodies. And in reality, the way this virus actually affects people at a subjective level is more multifaceted. Most people didn't die. They would get affected more subtly, more physiologically, like how you would with like a really bad sickness. 
And because of the way the only way the media could really understand this was through objective categories, case numbers, deaths, this very binary numerical way of understanding the pandemic, I think it, as a result, there's a sort of disenchantment in which people don't experience the, don't know how to understand the pandemic, the virus, and also don't feel like that representation applies because they see that and they're like, well, I don't get affected by this, so I don't believe in it. So there's a rejection of science, but it's partially due to the rejection of science by the right, but not just by the right, it's by a lot of people in general. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, actually a lot of phenomenon of new age spirituality, as we, as we were talking about earlier, coming from the left, the likes of Russell Brand is a very good per personification of someone who considers himself left of center, but is very much on the anti-vax train. And I think this whole phenomenon is a response to you know, the, the huge inadequacy in, in the ways in which science has been sold to the masses and the way in which science has even administered itself in this extremely one-dimensional calculating way that can't account for the experience of nature beyond like these narrow categories. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one thing to remember there is you're right. One may think, one may think well, you know, what's the deal with Adorno being anti enlightenment Although he, he does state that he's not anti enlightenment early on, but then he keeps kind of talking down enlightenment so much that, you know, you still feel, you know, perhaps he has a gripe. With That's how I used to feel. I'm saying like that was my first interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's yeah, clear yeah, that what he's doing. But. I, I've had a similar. I've had a similar objection with, by somebody who read uh, my yeah. second book, "Kimber Left Love to Me," which has a, a, a focus on Adorno uh, points. And uh, I talk about you know, Adorno's anti-rationalist arguments, and then somebody said to me, like, "How can you be anti-rationalist?" Um, and of course, anti-rationalism is it, it, not. A, it's not a good position, but. Adorno uh, is really saying, as uh, you, know, you identified since then, that the enlightenment didn't really happen. That's the problem. It's not so much the enlightenment was wrong. It was a false enlightenment. It was a stalled enlightenment. So it got so far, but it then re-adopted the habits of myth almost immediately. And that's, uh, I think, how you end up with Marxism having a lot of faiths coming down from mm -hmm. this like Messianic religion, for example. What would a real enlightenment be? I think it would be where you constant, constantly question at each juncture your conclusions, uh, not just in a scientific way, because that does happen to some degree in science, but that would have to go hand in hand with the power structure, such that you could end up somehow supplanting the human tendency to, to grasp that uncomfortable, controlling, practices. And I think the problem is we just, the human mind is not ready for that. And Adorno actually talks about what you call identity thinking. It's not. Yeah. Term, but identity yeah. That's thinking. in the against the epistemology um, collection. Yeah. Yeah. Identity thinking based on, it's covered you know, throughout modern general philosophy. One of my favorite essays. And uh, what it means is that we proceed in thought by identifying things under terms, under words, under numerical values, but we're never actually really capturing things. But, you know, we need to do that to feel that we have power. We need to, to progress. To escape the chaos of reality, as he says. Yes. Right. It, to, anyway, because you think on a very kind of basic level, even waking up and identifying a bed and the floor and the relationship between the floor and the bed, that's essential for getting out of bed. And that's not exactly what it all means, but, you know, it's like that. We, we need to name things to exist, you know. We can't not name things, but the tendency to identify is what leads us to identify all of nature and each other. So then you get a situation where we have right. a system which it's identifies us all. Of it. You have a runaway capitalist system which identifies everybody and, and we're all equally subjugated by it. So what Adorno, what Adorno proposes is non identity thinking, but it's not clear how that will function. It's just that that's what we need to be aiming towards. That's what I was going to ask is the next question actually was what his, what he prescribes because he says, quote, the critique of enlightenment given in this section is intended to prepare a positive conception of enlightenment, which liberates it from its entanglement in blind domination. And exactly what is that? Because from what it seems is what he proposes is a sort of 
Hegelian dialectics. He calls talks a lot about the I just forgot, but he calls it he in another book talks about negative dialectics. Basically, he, he seems to propose a dialectical thinking of some kind. Now, I've heard a lot of critiques of that because some people say that his version of Hegelian dialectics is actually already Hegelian dialectics, but he, like many yeah. readers of Hegel, thought Hegel was a thinker of totality when should he wasn't. Do. But yeah, I'm sure. What is that positive conception of reason? Because Marcuse has the same project. That's what is. Yeah, we have to do that book one time. It deserves a reading group of some type, some kind. I think it's done. It's like virtually not talked about because it's really, it's a really tough thing. You know, everyone knows it exists, but it's not like people are podcasts on negative dialectics. I mean, he talks about similar yeah. things in like his lectures, like ontology and dialectics. Like he. I mean, I think this thing is that, I mean, this thing, uh, I actually can choose, it's mainly because I don't know if I understood Hegel completely. I mean, Hegel is sort of going, I mean, this is something that people always say, that's not Hegel, but I mean, it mm -hmm. kind of is. Synthesis, and he thinks it's thesis. The reason that's not Hegel, it's not Hegel is because Hegel is not saying there's a final thesis and there is ending. So you don't have like, in Hegel, again, like, in like, like, you don't have. It's always contradiction. Hegel. One idea and then the contradiction of that idea results in a sublation of those two ideas of the new idea and that's the solution. Because he would then say that's the new pole of the dialectic and that's been proposed by another one. Right. Another Except another that one. I think oh, the was, disagreement is people think that sublation leads to the homogenization of those differences when it's more like a contradictory unity of those differences. Like those differences are still there, but incorporated into the whole. There's, that's the sublation. It's not so much that they are almost equalized because I don't know. I think someone who gets dialectics really wrong, for example, perfect example, Stalin's historical and dialectical materialism, who sees it very rigidly, like there's contradiction. We overcome it, and then it's this new thing. Mao Zedong is interestingly more, very I think, sophisticated in his dialectics because Mao is, says these contradictions are not actually resolvable. We have to deal with them. We have to work with them that there's these new contradictions. And he talks about how in communism, there will be more contradiction. There won't be the end of history. And contradiction, communism will just lead to new contradictions that are better well, and higher. That would be a good example, really, of what I think Adorno was going for. But I don't think right. not Adorno said now six. But I'm saying that the way you describe that is that you don't get to a, a final kind of spirit, I don't know, like a moment of resolution of utopia. You just get to the point where that there's no impedance of the constant uh, dialectical opposition resulting in a new kind of combination of those oppositions that, that leads to another kind of confrontation between another, you know, another opposite. The, 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 that, that's constantly happening. Now, enlightenment, I would say, because of the power structure that kind of first of is, that you don't have a situation where one can freely just penetrate the dialectic. See what I mean? There's, there's not a total openness to dialectical oppositions constantly interacting and then producing realities. What do you mean with What do you mean with regard to power structures exactly? The fact of an entity thinking, meaning that we're always aiming to control nature's identification of, of of natural objects. The fact of us always describing a numerical value measurement name to everything that has oh. its kind of correlate. In, politics where you will always have have domination of both the ecosphere and the human beings and your communities. So because of that, you have a situation in which inquiry, you know, whether it be self-education or group education, that's inhibited. You know, that, that, that you, that there is not a constant free flow discussion. In fact, the, the kind of power structure that I've just described is necessitates university schools, state education through TV, that, you know, he's always moving along the same line. So let's talk about Marx, let's talk about Hegel, let's talk about, I mean, we don't get enough of that, obviously, or state TV, but, you know, we're going to talk about some, a very few things, we're going to talk about very few things, and, and, and let's not talk about the ones that we burnt their books anyhow, or whatever, we put them in prison. I think that the power structure doesn't even allow for many things to be thought in the first place, let alone down and then published and then read by many different people. So I think it, a situation, you know, a kind yeah. of dialectics or a, a kind of 
a true enlightenment would be a situation where power didn't inhibit inquiry and therefore the amount of different combinations of dialectical confrontations would just explode. You'd have many more potential thoughts happening. And the dawn of negative dialectics is, is this is a thing that's confusing is that you don't get like Hegel, well, the true example of Hegel, thesis versus antithesis results in sublation, a synthesis of that, a correct answer somehow or a proven situation. Imagine that, you know, just for a moment, that is Hegel, even though it's too crude. What Adorno is saying is that we don't result in a, a in some kind of triumphant discovery. We result in another problem. It's always negative. The dialectic is always negative. It's not going towards some positive solution. So Adorno says that's important because if we ever imagine we're in the right place, that we've come to the solution, the risk is that in fact we're being somehow duped. And that we only think it's a solution because the power system is us it's a solution. Or in any case, we result at one solution. There's a risk that we're going to miss something. That nature is not programmed that way. It's always going to be a threat. So Adorno is coming more from the angle of perpetual negativity than a system pointing at an eventual triumph. But also where, bear in mind that Adorno is coming out of experiencing living through World War II, then emerging from World War II as a German Jew who saw the Holocaust. So he's really saying, you know, there can't be, we can't imagine that we arrived at a possible solution. Because the minute our eyes have lost the, the problem, risk of inversion into the barbarity of, of, of the Holocaust. Probably the audience will get the general idea of what you just explained of Adorno's point being we need a sort of dialectical rationality. And when he, in many ways, Adorno is anything but a anti-modernist thinker. He is a hyper-rational thinker to the point of being self-conscious of rationality and the flaws of reason itself and its tendencies because yeah, yeah. He, he is very hostile to things like, he's very hostile to, for example, occult, occultism. I, I remember he said occultism is philosophy for the dupes. Yeah. And he's, of course, like a sort of purist when it comes to music. He's definitely not a relativist. He thinks there's inferior and superior music. He's like, he is a high modernist, but someone who is self-critical as a modernist. But I guess the question I wanted to transition to was, well, what does this really leave us with? Because if to overcome this problem is just to develop this higher form of reason is, as you alluded to earlier, are we really equipped for that as humans? Are any humans equipped for that? Or, or are only some equipped to that? And can we overcome myth? That is sort of what I want to discuss in the uh, back room podcast uh, for patrons who uh, get access to an extra, extra episode for every new episode we have on this podcast. And uh, yeah, is like, can we overcome myth is, I think, a serious question for the Enlightenment because it, when one can make uh, assumptions in either direction that have their consequences. One being an unself-aware enlightenment that turns into myth or a acceptance of myth, which I think is a conservative position, a total acceptance of myth, a acceptance of the unchangeable is, a, I think, a naturally conservative position. And I think, is there a middle ground here or is there, you know, how do we think about this? I guess that's the, what we're going to discuss in the exclusive. But before we get to that, anything, any last things you'd like to add for the listeners? No, I think you have to look at it just, I don't know, he's, he's not going at any point that was in his own lifetime. Like, uh, when I say he's not going to, he wasn't going to relax and go, okay, well, maybe we have the answer. He, he, he wasn't going to see it that way because of his experience of World War II. So he's really, you know, he's taking every kind of, every, point where somebody says, yeah, but what if, so even the students are like, yeah, they start protesting and they, and they have their own vision of how a revolution might happen in 1969 in Germany, and he won't go along with it. And it's like one of the, one of the things that really hangs over a lot of legacy, he actually at one point calls the cops on his own students, which I guess, you know, if we hear it like that, it, it's kind of unforgivable. But what he's seeing is just that, you know, there's no guarantees that this won't the, you know, degenerate 
their movement won't degenerate into totalitarianism. He actually said that he's only arguing with Marcuse, actually. Marcuse, in a lesson, because ever Marcuse was, he was also part of the Institute for Social Research at the Frankfurt School and also exiled to America. But after the war, Marcuse stays in America and the Dono returns to, to Germany and carries on running the Institute. I actually teach at Frankfurt University. And Marcuse was, was very popular in the street, very key to the street in America. And, and he basically gets an argument uh, in a letter exchange with Adorno. And Marcuse, you know, he wants to know why Adorno won't support his students. And Adorno says that I, you know, I would have every confidence in the student, movement, but I see a, a drama, a small amount of a, a, a tiny amount of, of, of madness, which could revert into totalitarianism should they take power. So that's his thing that, you know, we haven't thought through things enough. We're still thinking in our identity thinking way so that anyone who takes power is subject to the same things which then hit the debate as it did, starting to behave as it did. Um, at that point, it was 1969, so it was apparent what happened under Stalin's regime in Russia. So, yeah, it's very much a negativity aimed at shoring up any possibility we have of making a better world. But you're never going to come at a point of view of like, hey, let's do this. You're not going to come from a point of view of like, well, hold on a minute. Let's not do that. Probably, which probably, probably they're often not acting at any given point and thinking than acting. So he's in a thinking philosophy to be the best opportunity we had. And I think that's really important for our times, actually. They I'd feel kind of similar, but the other thing we do seems to go to shift politically. So figuring the philosopher is unique again, although it's just so very hard to do philosophy because we're all put up in internet cloud, is it? Anyhow, that's my final thought. So I think people like you do a very good job. I will say finally. And thank you for having me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. in a lot of people want to always ask in response to diagnoses of problems. What do we do now? What can be done? And Adorno, as a true philosopher would, wants us to ask more questions than give more answers. And <clears throat> he thinks there is no guarantees. Now, one thing my mentor in grad school, one of my main mentors, used to always say was, we need a politics without guarantees. And his mentor was Stuart Hall. If you notice that Stuart Hall invented that phrase. Now, uh, my question with this, and this is where I depart a little from him, or I'm not necessarily decided, though, on my opinion on this, is can we have a politics without guarantees? I think the very nature of politics is that of guarantees, which is its relation to theology. And I think it's the realm of philosophy that is about rejecting guarantees and about trying to disentangle and think through contradiction and avoid myth. We'll get into that in the next discussion on can we overcome myth? Is what does this look like? What does an Adornian reason look like in practice? And is it viable for most of us who live normal lives? So, yeah, if you enjoyed this podcast, I would love it if you give it a five star rating if you get value out of this. And if you've been a regular listener of the show at this point, why not become a patron? You get extra content, you get way more podcasts, and it's also a really good way to support the channel. So yeah, take care.